I, t- I guess the, the recommendation would be to really make sure that we have a pure, good quality LVI. And then if we manage to keep doing that, I think we can reach to, uh, a good time to stability uh, sooner with less losses. Welcome to the Swine Health Black Belt Podcast, the latest swine health research digested for you. My name is Dr. Clayton Johnson, and I'm the host of the podcast. Joining me in our podcast studios this week is Dr. Maryam Awit Zacharias Muhammad. Dr. Maryam Awit is a postgraduate student and researcher at Iowa State University. Uh, and Mary, thank you so much for coming on to the show. Why don't you start with an introduction for the audience? Thank you very much for having me, Dr. Johnson. Um, my name is Mara Maritza Karas. I am um, a postgrad student, like you said, at ISU. I'm working with Dr. Giovanni Trevisan uh, in the uh, field of P team. And currently, I'm working on PERS virus uh, genome, specifically um, LVI. Salmonella presents significant challenges to pig health and performance and poses food safety risks to humans. As the first and only vaccine offering live attenuated strains of both Salmonella cholera suis and Typhimurium, Enterosol Salmonella TC from Boringer Ingelheim protects pigs against both serotypes with a single oral dose. Talk to your Boringer Ingelheim representative to learn more. You're doing a big survey uh, looking at LVI materials from the field, looking at real LVI materials that are being used and you're trying to shine a light in the black box of that LVI material. A lot of that stuff is collected, used on a farm, and uh, used with good ambition, but admittedly not always knowing exactly what's in there, what's the dose, what are all the pathogens that are in there. Um, So uh, talk to us, uh, Mary, if you would, about your project. What are you looking at? How are you trying to evaluate it? How are you trying to educate the industry on what LVI is and, and how we're making it? Yes. So uh, for a long time, there's been like a question, what else is in the LVI other than the PERS virus that we intended to give back to the herd? And so that's uh, why we started doing this uh research so to just figure out what is in the LVI and also to kind of like quantify um, the kind of practices that are involved and how varied they are. And so in order to do that, what we did is collect a survey from practitioners and also collect an LVI sample, serum sample um, intended for LVI use. And um, and then we have uh, qPCR and RT-qPCR to be specific and also NGS conducted on it. And then we did a uh, metagenomic analysis just to f- see um, all that is in the material and try to figure out if there are other pathogens that are swine interest that might be in there. And um, Mary, how many uh, different LVI samples are you able to look at? What sort of, uh, I guess, a scope of the project do you have? Is it just a couple or are you getting lots of samples from all over the country? So uh, we have about 48 LVI sample across eight states, the uh, U.S. states. And from that, we have a whole variety of um, PERS viruses. For example, we have about um, 11 lineages, PERS virus lineages, and those are 27 um variants and also like 18 RFLP patterns. So you can see like it's a very varied uh, sample. And uh, the most common ones that we found is kind of mirroring what's going on in the U.S., which is like L1A, L1C.5, L1, uh, L1C.2, and L1H are the most common that we have. Um And also in terms of like the practices, we, we used uh, a unique calculation to quantify how many genomic copies are being injected. Um, And for this PERS virus, uh, we have uh, from 49 genomic copies all the way to more than 253 million genomic copies being injected. And uh, as a comparison, we also quantified the 
vaccines that are used in the U.S., the six vaccines that are used in the U.S., and those ranges go from 60 million uh, to over 9 billion. So you can see that there is a, a really huge variety of you know, practices and also target genomic copies being given back to the herd. Mary, on the uh, the preparation, because as I understand it, you're also asking people for feedback on how do you collect and prepare the LVI. What sort of variation do you see in that part of it? Yes, so um, we see very different variation again, uh, and that is for, uh, after being collected, the serum sample, it uh, we have saline or PBS or water, like the three things that are being used, uh, saline and PBS being the most frequent one. And also you can, they can, sometimes we go back and ask them when we see uh, certain things that are confusing us. And also they, when they source the serum, it's also different. It's either like exsanguination or, you know, they could use a needle. Uh, and... Um, also, the LVI, when was given, it was given in a different doses. So we're like about 77% of our uh, samples were given in one LVI dose. Um, and then we have two in 20% and in 2%, we have three uh, LVI dose being given back to the herd. The results on the PERS testing side of it, I'm sure there's a lot of people that are really interested in how many samples have more than one PERS virus in it, because you're doing the NGS on the samples, so you can identify if there's more than one PERS strain there. Sometimes we might expect for there to be more than one PERS strain, because we know there's more than one PERS strain on the farm, but sometimes maybe we think there's only one PERS strain. So of the, like you said, it was 48 samples that you've got. Have you found some of those that had multiple strains? And was that a surprise to the veterinarian in that situation or did they expect it? Um, so that is a good question, Dr. Clayton. Um, we have about 15 percent uh to contain more than one first virus. And we also have like three uh, wild type being captured. And in some we have wild type and MLV combination and others or most would be containing um, wild type and wild type combination. And for most, it's really, like you said, we expect uh, multiple strains to circulate. Um, so I wouldn't say it was a surprise, but uh, being that being captured and then giving back to the herd have other implications such as a recombination event, which we found uh, a recombinant virus in this study as well. What about uh, non-PERS viruses or other uh, pathogens? Were you able to identify other items in the LVI that maybe were surprising? Yes. So uh, we have about 41% to contain other pathogens and uh, for virus, for other um, viral pathogens that are uh, in the LVI apart from PERS virus, we have parvovirus, we have influenza A virus, um, we have porcine astrovirus, PCV2, uh, porcine rotavirus A, and we have ortoriovirus. And we also found a strong indication of bacterial presence in the material, and that is um, Salmonella and Cidomonas being the most ones that are detected. With uh, you know finding rotavirus, with finding Salmonella, it kind of infers that maybe there's some contamination potentially, and with influenza, maybe maybe someone is uh, somehow using some respiratory tissue and adding it to their LVI. I guess that's unusual, but I guess where I'm going with all that is. Um, have you been able to share that information with the veterinarians who submitted it? And were they surprised to find those other pathogens there or no? They said, ah, we're we're grinding up tissues or something like that. And therefore, we know that there's likely to be contamination. Now, uh, for most, it was a surprise, to be honest, uh, especially the influenza one, which also caught us by surprise. And we we were going back to the diagnostician experts in a issue and uh, the, back to the vets, just talking to, to figure out how it might be in there. And there is always a possibility that it could be systemic, but there is also, like you said, um, where some of them use exsanguination, so there might be some sort of uh, a, contaminant, a contamination there, um, and we, we try to explain it that way. But 
uh, in order to eliminate that the possibility of contamination other than, for example, that sample comes from passes through a lot of states. And so to make sure those uh, contaminants are not captured in this analysis, we use uh, a very stringent um, settings and, and uh, cutoffs for, for that. Mary, are you connecting uh, these specific sites where the LVI material comes from to like the POMP project so that you can see diagnostic results and performance results? And then if so, for the farms that had, let's call it a contaminant, like a rotavirus or a parvo or an influenza, have you seen any unusual diagnostic results or unusual performance results that maybe are, are a result of the, of the extra pathogens being in the LVI? Yes. So for one, when you are, you know, when we are lucky enough that some of the farms are enrolled in POMP, we get to do a follow up. And uh, when we do for one that contain a parvovirus specifically, um, we were able to see that their mummies and stillborns were much higher and it continues to be uh like that before reaching their baseline or their target for a longer time compared to other farms that are in the same production system, but they didn't have parvo. So there are a lot of variables that you can consider, I guess, but it also really shine a light that, okay, this other pathogens might be uh, the problem for us because we we know from old pump um, data that the ones that use LVI have a higher loss, but they uh, they get to the time to stability a lot sooner than the other viruses or the other farms, excuse me, that use MLV, for example. And so we can you can see that LVI is really have a potential, but those losses could be. Uh, you know, because of what they contain, for example, multiple viruses and other pathogens. So um, I, th I guess the, the recommendation would be to really make sure that we have a pure, good quality LVI. And then if we manage to keep doing that, I think we can reach to a good time to stability uh, sooner with less losses. Well, Mary, I appreciate you coming on and updating us on your project. It sounds like we definitely still have some work to do as an industry on um, trying to put some science behind LVI if we're going to use it. And at minimum, I mean, we owe it to producers that we, we as veterinarians better be able to answer the question. If a producer says, well, how are you going to ensure that we're not going to have salmonella and influenza and parvovirus and PCV2 in this LVI material, we as veterinarians better be able to answer that question because it sounds like that's a real risk out there. Thank you so much for coming on. Thanks for doing the work, Mary, but then thanks so much for coming on and sharing it with us. Thank you very much for having me, Dr. Johnson. Yeah, well, um, it's the audience that allows us to do this, Mary. So we owe a thank you to the audience for participating in this week's episode. Uh, to the audience, if you haven't checked out our website, please go to swinehealthblackbelt.com. Check it out. You can see not only Mary's episode, but all the ones that we've put out before then. Uh, for Dr. Mary Emma Witt Zacharias, uh, I'm Clayton Johnson. It's been our pleasure to spend some time with you here, and we hope you have a great rest of your day. Thank you.